All right, welcome to Suhan Unfiltered, my podcast. I'm Jim Suhan. Today's guest live at Kieran's Irish Pub, where we are giving away free Guinness. Free Guinness says. I, I don't, still don't know what plural Guinnesses is. Or Guinness? I, I grew up in, uh, I mean, I'm an Irish kid, and I still don't know whether it's Guinness or Guinnesses or Guinness or whatever, but we are giving away Guinnesses to the first 50 people to show up at Kieran's Irish Pub tonight, live during the show, and, and who check in via some form of social media. Uh, Katie, our social media manager for the Alive and Social Network, is walking around the bar. You can ask her how to do it. We have people up by the stage who can help you as well. Simplest way is just follow me on Twitter and retweet something about the show, and somebody somewhere will give you a live Guinness, uh, a free Guinness. I promise you I already have mine. Are you going to have one, Brian? I'll have one. My guest is Brian Kalman, the defender for the Minnesota United FC, the, the new-slash-old team in town. Uh, and... Eric Durkey's here from the team. He was telling me about your family history. My so, family or, or ours and his together? Oh, well, that's, that's a different subject. We can get into that later. That's a, that's a yeah, different bring, show, bring that one up but later. it might be a that, good that'll, show. That would be a good one. Uh, so did you all start playing soccer when you were kids? I mean, it sounds like you yeah. have about what? How many siblings do you have? Four? I'm the oldest of six. Of six? So all soccer five. players? Everyone played soccer. Now, I hear Brad, like, didn't really make it that far. Is, are we going to give Brad some grief you here? what? At least you named him, because normally he gets <laughs> Durkey calls him He's the, the other, other guy? brother. The other brother. <laughs> brother. <laughs> so, no, Brad Brad was a little bit of a late bloomer, like most of the guys in our family, and uh, he made varsity his senior year and played pretty well. But uh, he can still play. He still plays men's leagues. Awesome. Yeah. And, and so who's the most accomplished member of the family? Um, well, I guess that depends on how you look at it. Yeah, it does. I'm going to let you define it. Well, I've always told my youngest sister, who is only two years pro, but who has played on the U-20s and the U-23 national team, I've always told her, if you get to nine years, then you can tell me that you're more accomplished. But, I mean, she has won gold medal at the, at the World Cup and stuff, so we'd probably have to say her. She's been to the Final Four. Final Four, I think, four different times. Wow. Maybe three. So, pretty incredible. Yeah. Uh, so how did you all start playing soccer? I think uh, I was the oldest. I just started playing. I don't know what. Like what my age? Mom and dad, six, five, six. Backyard or or No, like on the team, I was on a, a team called the Cheetahs. We had these bright gold jerseys and socks, white shorts, and uh, I just. You remember the socks? Wow. Oh, yeah. Must have been a big a good moment memory. in your life. I used to, uh, that, back then I was a goal scorer. You know, as I've gotten older, I've had to move back and start playing defense. Is that, and how did that affect your ego? I think that happens to all good forwards when they're younger. They get moved back to defense. So I, you know, I'm I'm not a born and bred soccer person. I, you know, I grew up, I mean, like I think the '40s. Let's say the '40s, and it was all baseball and football and basketball. And then as a parent, you know, the first thing I did was get all my kids involved in youth soccer. Uh, and what do you think the one in, in other sports, say especially I think basketball. And baseball, I find those sports to be almost too organized. Kids don't go to the playground and just kind of become creative and learn how to play the games on their own. They they have to be on the team. They yeah. just get the limited number of, of, of repetitions that you get during a, an organized practice, yeah. and a lot of them just don't develop that much. Is that what was it like for you in soccer? Did you go Did you go play with your buddies down the street, or did it have to be organized? You know, I think it was uh, it was a little bit of both. So I'm we're co- we come from an athletic family. My mom and dad were. My dad was what you said, football, basketball, baseball. My mom played basketball, ran track. Um, We did everything growing up. I wrestled. I did football, basketball. I moved to Minnesota, and all my friends played hockey. And I was like, I want to play hockey. So the next year I went out and started playing hockey. I made the C in-house team, but it was fun. I kept playing. Um, Same thing with my sisters. They all basketball and soccer letters. And I think four-year, most of them were four years Everyone was in soccer, but I think two out of the four, the two out of the three sisters were uh, four-year letter winners in basketball as well. And did you learn enough playing organized youth soccer to, to develop your career, or did you have to do a lot on the side? I did. It was a little bit of both. I mean, in our house in, uh, in Omaha, we would kick the ball against the side of the garage. We'd play World Cup, so one-on-one on one-on-one, you know, like everyone fight for the ball. And I think maybe that's kind of transitioned a little bit to how some of us play soccer now is – we kind of play physical, and we're ready to mix it up. Maybe that's why we all got moved back to playing defenders. 
you know, the big thing, the big trend when I was, I guess, college age and, and young adult was indoor soccer. There was a brief flurry of activity where not only were there indoor soccer professional teams everywhere, but where we would just go play pickup ball. We, so, we'd rent out an indoor arena and just go play pickup uh, indoor soccer. Was that a big part of your life or not? Uh, we never, you know, living in Woodbury, we didn't have like the traditional indoor where it was surrounded by boards and all that stuff. We had Bielenberg, um, but there wasn't a lot of open soccer back then, or, or our family was probably too busy for that So because we, we were doing other sports and I mean, we had six kids, so we were running around, going crazy across the town. I mean, from the time I was 16, I was driving my siblings to sporting events and, and kind of helping out. So. When, at what point in your life or your career did you get the idea that you could play soccer and make a living? You know, my story is I, I told my mom that when I was real little. She's like, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to play college soccer and pro soccer. And, you know, moms being moms, she was like, you know how hard that is? And... It's really hard to go pro and all that. And I was like, I just, I want to do it. So, I mean, it was, I would say I realized that I was pretty good at soccer when I was 15, 16 years old. And, and I mean, I was playing for like the best team in the state. I didn't know what I was going to be able to do. But like I said earlier, I was kind of a late bloomer. I went to a small D1 school and, and got a lot of playing time, fortunately, down there. And, and I progressed. And, and then I finished off my career at Creighton University, a well-respected school and, and soccer program. And uh, it's kind of a funny story. My, I think my mom was upset at me for some reason. And we had spoken on the phone earlier that day. And she called me up and was like, why didn't you tell me? And I'm like, tell you what? And I was like upset and kind of crabby. And she goes, you got drafted by the Thunder today. And I'm like, the Thunder have a draft? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, and I got drafted second round. And I think they had a draft the year, my second year. And then that was, and then, and then they stopped doing the draft for the second division, whatever it's been called. So I th that kind of was the day that I was like sitting down with my college, my college roommates, probably having beers, and I was like, "Dude, guys, I just got the phone. My mom, I guess I got drafted today." Like a couple weeks later, I left to go to preseason, and from there on, out, I was like, "This is my dream, and I'm going to try to live it in Minnesota and play as long as possible." Wow, how long do you think that can be? I have I signed a new new deal this year, so I have this year and, and an option for two more years. So I'm hoping I can finish that one out. That gets me to 33 years old and and over 10 years of playing here. So I could be happy with that. Uh, sell soccer to me. Not that you have to sell, sell soccer so to me, but but use me as the representative of the Minnesota public. Tell them why they should want to go to your games. Uh, your your opener is this Saturday, obviously. Uh, tell them why. Get your tickets because it's going to be a big crowd. You might not even have them available. All right, <laughs> this is that's why you want to do it. We yeah. sell sell that event, sell your sport to the Minnesota public. So, obviously, if you look around, it's it's the most popular sport in the world. They play it in every country. I mean, we were fortunate enough to go to Brazil and this year in England, last year, and kind of see it and other how it's the culture. And that's what it is. It brings a culture. It brings crazy, passionate fans. We're lucky. We have the dark clouds that, uh, that are there, and, and I've been fortunate enough to see them grow over the years. And, I mean, it's the best atmosphere apart from Indian that it, you will see in our league. I mean, because they, they sell out crowds over 10,000 every game, and they're great. But our dark clouds are even louder than their whole huge section of, of crazy fans. And, I mean, there's flares, there's fireworks. They, they run and put up the, the number by hand when we score goals. Like, there's, like, it's tradition, too, right? It's, it's been growing, and it's uh, the last couple of years being with United, but that's why they chose United is they want to keep everything together from, like, the kicks to the thunder to the stars to, like, United and, and unite our company and, or our uh, community. It's just... There's no other sport that, that brings bonds and friendship and, and love like soccer does. Well, I'll give you credit for this, uh, and I've covered a lot of press conferences in my time, and usually I hate press conferences because they're very dry and somebody telling you about some kind of a financial deal, and you know, if there are fans in there, they're kind of standing in the back just making noise at the wrong times. I, I thought, were you at the press conference? I was. I, I, was, yeah. I, I was actually. Uh, I was not going to miss that. I was very impressed by that. That was, uh, that was very artfully done. It was very entertaining. The speeches were, were actually uh, 
enlivening instead of deadening like so many of them are. And, and the Dark Clouds came up and sang their songs. I, I think that's the right way to put a press conference on. You know, it was me and Christian were the, were the first ones there. We got interviewed earlier that day, and, and we saw the Dark Clouds over in that side room getting their scarves and getting their T-shirts, and we went over and we took a big selfie with everyone, and, and we're talking to all the fans. And that's, you know, that's something that, that United have that other teams don't is we, we have a bond with our, with our friends, our, sorry, families and our friends and our fans. And it's not only just the dark clouds, it's people that come to games and bring their kids. Like, I'll make sure I will walk around and sign. If you're up against the wall, I will sign every single person's autograph before I go into the locker room and, and take the shower or take a nice bath or whatever I need to do. And that's, that's something that has started back in the thunder that we were always really accessible and, and it's, progress through the organization and that's something i think that's you know really special hey, tell me about the dark clouds when, when did you first become aware they're of that? a bunch of crazy crazy people but uh <laughs> they're they're what make it worth going out and playing for it's like when you see someone that looks at you with like that much passion and like loves what what this team is and what it means to be affiliated with united it's it's something that's just kind of weird and crazy and it's awesome do you ever, uh, I mean, do you ever, like, ask them to stay at least 10 feet away? No. I mean, any no, restraining orders? They're not orders, that crazy. Nothing they're like not, that? They're no, they all, they'll, they'll come up and, like you said, we're accessible. So they talk to us at the after parties, and, you know, they follow us on Twitter, and some of them are Facebook friends and stuff like that. And, you know, you take, uh, I mean, there's, there's a family that I probably have taken over 50 pictures with in my career, you know, and they come to every game, and then they take pictures, and... That's awesome. You think they know what you look like by now? I know. They need reminders. That I think. Family. I think that's how maybe they base like their their children's growth. <laughs> this was when she was twelve. This is when she was twelve and a half. 13, so. You're a live a live growth chart. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, nobody's ever asked me to do that. Uh, so let's mix in a little bit of other uh, sports here. Uh, I was at the Wild game last night. Are you? What other sports do you care about? First of all, I care about. I care about all sports except football. I don't really, I'm not. American football? I care about my, my fantasy team, and that's about it. Okay. Like, uh, it so have things. you been following the Wild? I have been following the Wild. We actually, can't, what was the final number? Andrea, yeah. To, we went and played uh, Let's Play Hockey. We went and said that. Ten of us total. Wow. Is that including my wife? Ten players. Ten players. Wow. With some wives and, and fiancés. We're talking about actual ice hockey here. Yeah. Cool. We actually were on the ice after the game. Who was the Steve Ott of your group? Who was starting fights? Me, because Kevin Venegas uh, wore an L.A. Kings jersey. Oh, and you don't like that. Why would you wear an L.A. Kings jersey to a wild game? It's really the wrong year to wear one, too. I will say that, too. Every year is the wrong year to wear one. <laughs> so is there an equivalent to someone like Steve Ott in the soccer world? Is there a kind of a hooligan, on, <laughs> on the pitch hooligan? I mean... I think you're looking at one of them that uh -oh. used to be. That used to be. So they, so you got a the rep. dark clouds used to call me Red Card Coleman. And <laughs> I, really, I'm, I kid you not, in the earlier parts of my career. But since I've gotten married to my wonderful wife, Jay, and, and had a son, and the, even really since I met Jay, I've cooled it down a lot. Cooled it down a lot. So it's been two years, two years, over two years since I've had a red card. Which so is pretty crazy. Statute of limitations has run out. You get a fresh start. I hope so. I mean, I haven't heard the dark clouds call me red card Coleman for a while, so maybe I'm starting to change minds. So, what's the worst thing you did? <laughs> I think I got a red card for <laughs> early in the game. One of my buddies I thought got elbowed in the face, and I ran up and grabbed two guys by their throat. And, two uh, guys by the two throat. guys by the throat. You think you're Vin Diesel or something? I thought. I guess I. I think I watched like one of his movies the night before. It, it just it kicked in, and I ran up and did it. Straight red. See you later. Maybe 30 minutes into the game. Sporting Kansas City. Preseason. <laughs> That's Eric Durkee with the team calling out minute. reminders of all the bad things. Yeah. So wait. That Brian so Eric, ever done. Eric's trying to talk about something else that happened in preseason, which. No one ever put anything out on Twitter or anything really about. No, you saved it for the show, and I um, appreciate that. Well, he's saying, what about that game? I didn't get a red card that game. So what did you do? <laughs> what did you do, Brian? Oh, that's not going to change the subject. Okay. <laughs> um, but there were several altercations in that game. 
And I think after the first one that was uh, maybe some open hand slaps thrown, not, not by me, not by the other guy. We were not involved. I was actually not even playing. Um, the ref pulled out two yellow cards. And uh, there was a few other incidents after that that just kind of kept everything boiling. And I got in the game, and, and this guy kind of fouled me, and I didn't, I'm getting up. I don't know. I don't want to say names, but I'm getting up. And <laughs> thanks, Eric, for putting me on the spot on this one. I'm getting up, and I kind of just like went like, "What? What the? You know, swear at him or whatever." And he gets up, and he just like with the butt of his hand hits me right in the face. And so I grab him by the throat, ironically enough, and uh, he hits me again. And at that point, I just kind of lost it a little bit, and uh, I never got a red card. But they decided to not play the rest of the game. <laughs> <laughs> so, they gave the there game, were only a couple minutes left. They gave the entire game a red card because did, of you. That's did. awesome. They said everyone involved, uh, just get up. Well, you know, in my limited soccer playing past, I always found it to be a very chippy game. I, for me, the games that are all out hitting, you know, that's where you channel your violent urges. It's the games that aren't supposed to be violent where you're always trying to get a little upper hand. Basketball, to me, is a very chippy. Yeah, if you go over to Target Center, you know, or over to Lifetime Fitness, and watch a bunch of guys my age who have no lateral movement try to play basketball, they're going to hack the crap out of each other the entire game. Do they have seating and, over there to watch that? Uh, actually, they do, and it's complete, always completely empty. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, I, used to play a lot of, I used to play a lot of hoops, and I wouldn't have watched myself. But really, I mean, the games where you're not supposed to touch each other are the games where it gets really chippy because there is going to be contact, and you're probably not going to respond to it too well to it. I used to, you know, even playing intramural soccer, I always wanted to knock somebody down once in a while. Yeah. No comment? No, no. for sure. I, I completely agree. I, I, I didn't hear a question or anything. Uh, no, this, <laughs> this isn't an interview. This is a conversation. So I just expect you to kind of, you know, fess up on, yeah. and tell me all the worst things about yourself whenever you feel like it. That's, that's perfect. That's what I'm here for, right? Um, you know, that, that's funny you're actually saying that because a story kind of comes to mind. Let's, let's go. So last week we were, uh, we were at training, and I don't know if you know, my little brother's on the team as well. I, I just found that out. Yeah. Brent, so, right? Brent, yeah. He's, he's got long hair, and he has a big beard. Kind of looks like that guy over there. <laughs> but he uh, – He's stalking you. He decided to kick me after the play. No, I wasn't – the ball wasn't even there or anything. Kicks me after There's the play from behind. Brian. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, on the show. Oh, Sorry I was cheers. a little late. That's all right. It happens in Minnesota. It does. I'm not a city boy anymore. I live out in the suburbs. So – Anyway, so he kicks me off the ball, and I'm, like, looking for a foul. Manny said that my team gained advantage. We can disagree. I start yelling across the field at my brother. I'm going to get you. Give me a shot. Something I can't remember the choice words I was picking. But he looks over and says something to me, and people are like, dude, that's your brother. I, like, I, don't, I don't care. Like, I'm going to kick him if I get a chance. <laughs> and did you? You know, unfortunately, he, he knew I, he knows me. He's my brother. He knows how to avoid you. He, he, that's what it was. I had two opportunities where my eyes were getting big, and, uh, and he avoided it. Well, you know, there's a famous old twin story. Uh, actually, it happened, I think, during, during a championship season when uh, Danny Gladden and, and Steve Lombardozzi got into it. I don't know if you remember this story, but they were arguing back and forth. I think it was 87. Arguing back and forth, getting into it in the clubhouse, and finally, I might have the story backwards, but you'll get the gist of it. I think Gladden goes over to Lombardozzi's house during the middle of the season, knocks on the door, and fights him in the front yard. Really? Yes. <laughs> now, you know where your brother lives, so that is one way you could get back at him. You can just knock on the door and take him out. No, it's, I, was, I was heated after training, but fortunately enough, he came over and was like, I'm sorry that I was upset, and I'm sorry it was you I took it out on. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, you're lucky you said that because I was, I was going to hold a grudge <laughs> on that one. Now, how do your parents handle all this bickering? It's, it's not a lot of bickering. My parents are great. They're, uh, <laughs> my parents are crazy, really crazy. Like, they, um, they travel all across the country to watch my siblings play, whether it was college. My youngest sister plays professionally in Boston. My dad's already been out to see her play a couple times this year, and now they, they fly more because my mom has per, uh, some flying perks, if you want to call them that. Um, but they used to drive everywhere. My dad would drive to, like, Omaha to watch my younger brother play, then drive 
to West Virginia to watch my sister play, then drive to Florida to watch my younger sister play. Like it, it was, he put some serious miles on his car just to watch his his sports and um, or his siblings play kids play sports. Sorry about that, but uh, he, I think both of them are just kind of why we're all tough players and you weren't allowed to cry and it was like just get on with it and I think that's why it was we've had success in, in the soccer world and been able to play college and three of us play professionally two of my other sisters played for the lightning back when the wow. Minnesota Thunder had a women's team so cool. what do you want to call that semi-pro or yeah so the three of you who play professionally now I'm going to ask some stupid questions because I don't know things about thought there were salary structure and all that um the three of you who play professionally, can, can you all just live off your soccer salaries or are you having to augment it elsewhere? Um, because I know, you know, I know the I, WNBA players and, you know, they play in the WNBA and they make a, some of them make a reasonable salary here, but they go overseas to make the real money. Yeah. So we don't, no one has other jobs in the team. Some of us coach. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, could I live off what I make playing? Yeah. But I have a wife and a kid, so I want to yeah. make more, right? Oh, I get I always, it. I'm a I mean, capitalist, I'm an American. too. I'm a, yeah, I want to... I always want more, but a lot of the players do not coach. Put it that way. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. Uh, so we talked about the press conference, uh, which the new, you know, the new stadium that's still being worked out was announced. Uh, how big a step was that to you in terms of soccer in Minnesota and, and for that league and for your team? Well, I think, you know, I think part of the reason why – like, I've had op other opportunities. I've had teams call me when I was younger um, when I had options that weren't picked up or I was out of contract. But to me, it's I've always believed in soccer and this sport, you know, and I, th I think that's what United does. That's what our owners does, our front office. That's what everyone That's what everyone does. They believe in this sport and they believe in this town. So to see that, you know, obviously we've been, oh, it's between us and a couple other cities for quite some time and, you're starting to look at it like, yeah, they, well, Sacramento gets good fans, but like, think about what our owners do. You know, they have they have money and they're willing to invest in this in this team, and and they believe in it so much. So that was just that day was amazing. Um, when I had the opportunity, I mean, we just got back from Brazil. I hadn't seen my wife and, and my son for 14 days, and it was like the day after or two days after we got home. And I'm like, I had. To, go to the MLS thing or hang out with my son. And fortunately enough, my parents were like, we'll watch Kingsley, you know, you go to that because it's pretty, uh, it's a special day for the state. You know, during my entire lifetime, we've always seen, we've seen soccer grow in popularity, but at a very uneven rate and an unpredictable rate, you know, and, it, and people thought that when the U.S. women's national team, you know, had Mia Hamm on it and, and won in spectacular fashion, that was going to create a, a great impetus for the sport. We've seen, you know, the U.S. men's national team become more and more scrutinized. Uh, we've seen Olympic soccer become more more popular. We've seen all these things add up. And you've seen, frankly, more and more people start go to pubs on weekends in Minneapolis to watch the games. Uh, is this, do you think this is finally the time when it becomes more of a mainstream sport? Oh, for sure. And especially in this city when, I mean, in the next few years, I know United's already sold a bunch more season tickets, and they're, we're expecting a huge crowd tomorrow night. It's just going to keep growing because they, they're pushing the product, and our staff is doing such a good job at getting everyone out there and, and getting our name out there and making sure everyone's aware. I mean, there's been articles all the time in the newspaper, like people I went to school with that always have known I've played for the second division team, whatever it was called, right? They're like, I haven't spoken to them in years, and they're sending me Facebook messages and stuff like, oh, this is awesome, I'm so happy for you, and, and saw that. And I mean, am I going to be around in 2018? I don't know. But I'm always going to love United, and that's always going to be my team. Are you, you think you're living here for good now? I'm a, I'm a Minnesota guy. I'm a Minnesota guy. So what's the draw? Because, I mean, I, I chose to live here. I moved here in, in 1990, and I've been here 25 years, and I think I'll retire here. But that was a choice. You know, you, you grew up here. You've all, you have options to go elsewhere. Why, why, what is the lure of Minnesota my, to the Minnesota? My, family, my family's here. Like me, my mom, my dad, my siblings, we moved up here when I was 10. We're all still here. We're the only ones. Like most of my relatives are back in Omaha. But 
it's it's so amazing that when I need help, I can drop my son off at my mom and dad's house. And like yesterday, I had the day off. I said I called my dad. I said, "What are you doing? Like, how many how many grandsons do you have?" And he goes, "I got all of them." I said, "I'm bringing Kingsley over, and like, let's take him." So we took him to this place called uh, Lookout Ridge in in Woodbury. It's just like playground. Like, let him climb on stuff, and we just went and let him do that. And it's I want Kingsley. I don't know if I'm gonna have. I'm not gonna have six kids myself. You know, if, I'm gonna have a couple, but. I want him to be close with his cousins and, and grow up with them. And like to, to me, family's important, and that's why I've played my whole career here. But I went to school in Florida for two and a half years, too. So that was kind of the time that I was like, I'm going to go get away, cause a little bit more trouble than I have been, and you know? And as soon as I was able to, I went back to Creighton because it was close and it was a high level. I came right back here six months later. It is. I've lived all over the country, and I've traveled all over the country and, and over most of the world, too. It is remarkable. I mean, listen, the weather stinks. We're looking at a snowstorm outside in late April. Yep, There's no, six months of the year. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just horrible for six months of the year. It is remarkable, though, uh, just how – I hate to use the word quality of life. It sounds like a chamber of commerce phrase. I'm trying to think of something, some other way to describe it. But, you know, I've, I've lived in other places, including St. Louis, and – you don't have the parkland. You don't have the lakes. You don't have uh, the natural beauty. You don't have and and one advantage of our terrible winters is, you know, the grass and the and the plants actually get a chance to grow, go dormant. So when they come back, they're fully alive. You know, you go play a golf course in uh, in St. Louis in the summer. It's a hundred degrees and everything's baked brown. You know, here it's this lush green landscape. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah it is. I love it. And it's great and it's great for youth sports in that way, you too. You know what also He's, I love about that? It's like it's so cold here for so long that as soon as it, like, one nice day, everyone's outside yep. in shorts, and it's, like, 45 degrees, you know? If you go about to the other side, like, in the fall, it's 45 degrees. What's everyone wearing? Long pants, long yes. shirt, coats. They're ready for the winter. It's crazy. Yeah, well, and, you know, I... I I, I'm lucky I get to cover some major golf. I was at the Masters you know, last year, and I, I always have to remind people that where uh, was that at uh, the Masters Augusta, Georgia, okay. and I always have to remind people from all of you know all the more obvious golfing states, Florida and Texas and California, that there are times when the there are more golfers per capita in Minnesota than any other state, and it's for exactly the phenomenon you just described, which is when you get a chance to go outside and do something. In this state, you go outside and do something, mm-hmm. which is probably a great thing for you guys playing outdoors and getting to oh, yeah. getting you know capitalizing people's uh, quest to get outside and do something fun. Well, I think that's a huge reason why our owners with the with the new stadium and all that they want an outdoor stadium with grass. They don't yeah. want an indoor stadium yeah. with turf, like because I mean that's something that it's amazing here that we don't we have all seasons. The crazy part is in our during our season for NASL, we have all four seasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Like some of the, I think one of the Brazilians has never seen snow here, and he was already here this year. He's like, "What's that out there?" <laughs> you know, now their kids, the Brazilians' kids, love snow. Where's the coolest place you've tra- traveled? Soccer was cool. Brazil was cool. England was cool. But my favorite place is Aruba. Is where? Aruba. Oh. It's amazing. Always heard about it, never been there. You got to go. Me so and my wife. What's amazing about it? The beaches are amazing. The, the, water, the water is like crystal clear blue and beautiful sunlight. We, like, we, had, we were sitting so we saw every single sunset on the beach at night. We would walk along the beach to our, the, the restaurants and it was like sunset. Perfect. It's like 11 miles north of Venezuela or something. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? I've been to Venezuela. I've not yeah. been to Aruba. Maybe I should stop there. Go. Venezuela was great go back. when I was there. That's cool. Uh, I'll be going to Brazil for the Olympics in, I guess, is that next year? Do you know that we played at the stadium we played our first game at? Was Bodo, Eric, was Botafogo our first game? Second. Our second game, we went to Rio, and we played in the stadium where all the track and field is going to go down. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Wow. Still being worked on. But they need to redo the track. The track was not in good shape. Well, tell me about playing soccer or football in in uh, in England. What was that experience like? I actually got to cover some Olympic soccer there. 
That was awesome. I mean, we stayed at St. George Park. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah. It's it's just amazing. Like, they had these they had these showers at the pool area where it would sound like the rainforest, and it would be hot water. Then you'd hit a button, and I can't remember what would play because I, I think all my senses were, were frozen, but, like, 35-degree water would come out, and it was like a, a, an ice bath contrast shower. And some of us did it every day, but it was like, what? They're, the facilities there were just incredible. They had they had these pools with walking uh, treadmills underneath them for rehab and, and all that stuff. It was uh, definitely an eye opener. I don't think most NFL teams have facilities like where we were there. Wow, uh, I remember the the Vikings stayed in some posh resort too. It was just beautiful, but I can't honestly. I'm blanking on the name of it. I don't think it was St. George's though. Oh, we we weren't a resort. It's a soccer. Oh, okay. It's like 11 soccer fields, an indoor soccer field. Um, it was. We walked in and they were like Nike banners, like on the front desk. Like it was a soccer hotel and like I can't remember. I think we were like an hour or two away from London, maybe even more than that. And it was in the middle of the countryside, all about soccer. Like let's get after it. What uh, did you have much fan interaction? Did you get to meet any hooligans? I think we met some hooligans. Beat any up? I think we. I didn't. I did not beat any up. But the first game, we went to a small town, um, Matlock Town. It was awesome. They. Uh, I think they still follow me on Twitter. Awesome. And uh, you know they'll they'll occasionally they'll be like good luck or whatever. But it was a small. I think they were like a non-league or like a seventh division team. But a lot of young guys. But they could play. I mean, we ended up winning the game three to one. But uh, we hung out with them a little bit after and their fans, and we had dinner and stuff before we left. But. This, the owners actually took us to a couple games, too. Awesome. So we had, like, a behind-the-scenes look at Darby County, and they showed us, like, all the suites and all this and, and all the locker rooms and, and all their trophies and all that. And then we had a dinner at the stadium before the game, and then we were able to sit. And a lot of the players found out we can gamble. You can gamble at those games over there. I know. That's crazy. Yeah. What is it, the hill? I can't remember the – Walter Hill, or there's some, so some famous uh, company that basically every, it's like 7-Elevens over there. You walk down the street and there's one on the corner. You walk in and bet on anything you want. Yeah. It was, it was crazy. You could bet who scores first, what team scores first, what player scores first, what minute they score in. Mm-hmm. It was, I don't think, I think my brother was one of the only guys that won money on the, t- on the game, but it was, uh, that's frowned upon over here. Right? Yes, but, but uh, Although, you know what? The NHL is going to go to, the, to Vegas and it's going to clear the path and all the major teams are going to end up in Vegas and the stigma will be removed eventually. I mean, now you have now you have the commissioner of the NBA uh, and, and the commissioner of Major League Baseball saying, oh, well, fantasy, you know, fantasy sports, that's fine. It's just whatever he does. It's gambling. Yeah. It's, you know, eventually it's going to be like marijuana. Everybody's just going to get sick of fighting about it. And it's going to be legalized, yeah. I think. Uh, my guest is Brian Coleman, defender for the Minnesota United football club uh, who will be starting their season this weekend. Uh, please check out their website for all the ticket information. Fill up the joint. I'm Jim Suhan. The show is Suhan Unfiltered. You can find it at suhanunfiltered.com. You can subscribe for free via iTunes. You can listen anytime on iHeartRadio. Next show is tomorrow night, Wednesday night at 4 o'clock at the Liffey, right by the XL Energy Center. My guest will be my, uh, my partner, Michael Russo. Star Tribune hockey writer uh, will be previewing the Blues Wild Series. Uh, We'll be right back here at Kieran's Irish Pub where we are giving away free Guinnesses to anybody who uh, checks in on social media. So we'll be right back after this. I'm sorry? I'm trying to get this <clears throat> could you hear me all right or no? Uh, yes. I realize I'm not used to the mic, and I was I could hear well, it. Well, uh, this is this is the problem with uh, my my office teaching me new technology. I was trying to run an ad there, and it does not seem to be working. So we're just going to go ahead and keep on talking, uh, and we'll put the ads in later. So you're you're stuck talking to me some more here. Um, <coughs> That's why I'm here do, for right. Who do you like internationally? Like what players and teams do you follow internationally? I like the U.S. I like Miguel Ibarra. No one knows, but he's my adopted son. Really? Yeah. Well, you just broke the news right here. We did. Uh, I also have another adopted son. It's Christian Ramirez. So. 
So you didn't just go the easy way with Messi or something? No, it was, I mean, they're, in their own way, they are. There's something, you know. Mm-hmm. But it was, that's a funny story. It was like the first night at Miguel's, first year was 2012 for the Stars. And um, after the first night, we played here at the Metrodome. And then we went, uh, we went out, and my wife was like, oh, he's so cute. Like, let's adopt him. And we've been joking around ever since, but he's my adopted son. So. Have you filled out any paperwork? That's the key. No, I need okay. to get that all done, especially now that he has national team caps, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you care about Barcelona? Do you, do you follow Premier Barcelona, League? it would be my favorite, favorite club team. I just I like the way they play. I like Man City, too, a little bit. I don't, you know, I'm not a fan that's like, I'm a diehard. Like that's, I just like to see good soccer, good football. What is the hardest aspect of the game physically? Do you think you could go out and run around for 90 minutes, 45 minutes straight, maybe a couple extra minutes, 15-minute break, and then you got to do it again? Honestly, that's about the only thing I was ever good at in sports. I could just run forever. But I couldn't play soccer well while doing it, but I could run around and bother people yeah. for that, that amount of time. I played, I played lacrosse. I was a midfielder, oh, so running, running did not bother me. No, lacrosse wasn't big in, in Minnesota back when I grew up. No. I bet it, if I would grow up now, I would have played lacrosse. Like, it's a great, hitting, yes. Yes. Like, it, running, yes. Competing, yes. I mean, and everybody gets to play like, quarterback in lacrosse. You can do like some fancy Cradling, stuff. Cradling, yes. Right? Cradle and yeah. behind the backs and no looks. And. I don't know if it's ever going to make it big as a spectator sport, but it is a blast to play. Yeah. Because, again, you have everybody gets to touch the ball. Everybody gets to score. You know, defenders don't score as much as offensive players, but they can. Like soccer. Uh, yeah, like soccer. Uh, and you can hit, and you can be violent, and, uh, and it's high scoring. You know? uh, what, do you, what do you say when people who don't like soccer say it's either too slow or I don't like to see the ball, you know, the passive passes back, or I don't like uh, the level of scoring? What's your argument? There? I don't know. It's, I just came up with – I thought of a story. This is, I'm not going to answer your question. Okay. But there's this – you said that there was this guy uh, last week when we were on the on the road. Where were we? In Orlando, and we were all sitting like downstairs waiting for our team meal or something. And this guy comes up and he starts talking. It's like, "Oh, you guys a soccer team or what, what sport do you play?" And we're like, "Soccer." He's like, "Oh, I don't, I don't get it. Like, it's just a lot of running around and with not kicking the ball." And then he starts to, like pitch us this to his products that would benefit <laughs> soccer players to what he what he thought. And I want to be like That's bad salesmanship yeah, right there. First of all, don't come and talk to me right now like that. But and then he says something about I was a cross country runner and then I said, Stop. You said we do a lot of pointless running with, you know, <laughs> to kick a ball, like what, what do you call a cross country? But I mean it's it's a different fitness. I can respect it. It's it's not a sport that I would be good at. But well, I ran cross country and track in high school, and by the end of high school, I never wanted to run again. And and, and I actually actually told all my running buddies, I said, I'm never going to run again unless I'm chasing a ball or a story. <laughs> and and I haven't, you know. Uh, I I actually that's why I went and played intramural soccer in college. I love to run. I love to stop action. I love I love to run with a purpose. In soccer, you're always running with a purpose. Yeah. Um, Sorry, what was your question? Every, well, I was at, you know, I, I was kind of getting back to the, the cliched uh, complaints, the cliched American complaints about soccer. And I was wondering if you, how you responded when people said, you know, like that guy, you know, like you said, you know, uh, not, not high scoring enough or too slow. What, what's your response to that? Well, it's, it's funny. I actually saw this on Twitter. I can't remember who it was. Because I like baseball, so I think it was Bruce nothing McGuire. slower than baseball. I think it was Bruce McGuire, that, uh, one, of the, one of the dark clouds, great man. Um, I think he tweeted uh, and something talking about how low scoring soccer is, but if you think about football, fourteen to three, you know how many how many goals, if you will, were scored? You know, two and a half, yeah. basically. Yeah. So <laughs> we have games that are way over that in soccer. Well, here I'll, I'll actually throw one of my. I, I came up with this a long time ago when I was trying to figure out why. Americans didn't like soccer more. Um, and I came up with something called the, the oh, what's it called? It's basically, I, I forgot my grand name for, for my theory now, but the idea is that it's a ti- there's a timing mechanism involved. Americans want something to happen immediately. Short attention span, action-based. 
Uh, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's, it's the reality. They want what they want right now. Uh, that's why half-hour sitcoms and you know, action movies do so well in America. And baseball, you're going to have a resolution to each pitch every 10, 15 seconds. Now, not much might, you know, the game might be slow as heck, but at least every 10, 15 seconds, you're going to have a, a, a ball thrown. It's either going to be a ball, a strike, or put in play, or foul. Something's going to happen that you can define. In football, it's whatever the, the play clock is, 30, 45, 30 seconds, whatever it is, and every play counts as something. In, in basketball, 24-second shot clock or 35-second shot clock, uh, and, and Americans love keeping track of stuff, too. So every play counts in some category. I think, and I think Americans were slower to pick up both hockey and soccer because there's action that isn't defined or timed. You can, you can take your time with the ball in soccer. Uh, there's no shot clock. You can do what you want. You can pass it backwards looking for a strategic advantage. And I'm not sure the American mind know, knows what to do with that. And similarly, hockey, you know, it's a loose puck. Uh, people don't really count turnovers very much. And you don't know, in both those two sports, you don't know when something is going to happen. You know, I, <laughs> I, I tell kids that I coach, if you don't want to think, go play basketball, football, or baseball, right? Like they... They draw up plays, or if the ball's hit here, this person covers here. Like, it's routine, right? It's it, in, in hockey and in soccer, it's not like that. It's You get the puck, like, you have options. You always have options, right? Maybe you have, like, certain tendencies or, or patterns that, that you practice, but every single there's, – there's plays every game, right? So it's – think about it. Instead of football runs plays every 12 seconds, we have to run them every single time the ball moves, right? It moves here. Oh, I got to go here. It, this happened. I got to do this. And and if you're thinking a lot of times at this level, if you're thinking like that, you're way too slow. You have to be thinking two plays ahead of the time, starting to make your runs, like picking up on tendencies from your teammates and what they like to do. So if you look at it that way, there's way more action than any other game. Right. It, it's a it's a more free form. Yeah kind of action, which for some reason has always been more popular in Europe than here. Now, I, I think everything evolves and, and all worldwide trends spread across the globe, and I, I don't think that's going to be any kind of a, a barrier going forward, but it, you know, to date it has, been, it has been a little antithetical to, to your average American sports fan who, who is used to watching football on TV and knowing the commercials coming up yep, next, you know? Yep, yep. No, you hit, hit that right on the head. That's, I think that's a huge, a huge thing. They, and what do you do when there's a commercial? You quick check something out. Oh, absolutely. Right? You're like, oh, what about the other game? Or, but yeah. with soccer, you don't have to do that. You just get to watch the game for 45 minutes before the first break. No question. And, and I do <laughs> tell you one thing I've learned to really love about any sport that is uh, – any sport that doesn't take four hours to play. Because, you know, I grew up loving baseball. I covered baseball for a long time. I still like baseball. But the idea that they're going to ask you to spend three and a half or four hours <laughs> to watch a nine-inning game – has absolutely driven me crazy. I've really come to appreciate a two-hour, 15-minute basketball or hockey game or a, you know, how, how, what's two hours basically for an average yeah, soccer game? You 90 know? minutes from start to finish with like a 15-minute yeah, I mean, 15 minute overtime. I, I, God, I love you might that. have some injury, injury time here, but. I love that. I mean, we're all so busy, we have, and we have so many entertainment options. I just don't want to devote four hours a day to something, you know. The Twins have to be real. And as much as I like having a Major League Baseball team in my town, and I write about them all the time, I don't want them to take up you know, basically an average of 24 hours a week. I, I want it to be something that can fit into my entertainment schedule. Yeah. Uh, speaking of entertainment, especially when I have people on for the first time, we tend to break out and talk about a few different subjects, uh, kind of call it broadcast news. So I'm just it doesn't have to be your favorite of all time, but just give me something. Just give, give me kind of a gut reaction. Give me a favorite TV show. <sighs> TV show. Oh, I don't even want to admit this. Currently, it'd have to be Nashville. Oh yeah, I haven't yeah. watched it. It's good. There's like a lot of like country singing and stuff in it, but you're a country guy. Well, I, I'm an all music kind of guy. Yeah. I don't listen to a lot of country. If I do, it's Garth Brooks, mm -hmm. who I was able to meet uh, last year in the season at the Children's Hospital. But um, it, it is, I don't know. It's a good show that I can watch with my wife, and if my son's around, he can watch it too because they're singing. So he's like, and what's right? what's the woman's name? The redhead in the starring role. I'm blind. Oh my God! Why are you she was in Friday Night. 
I, I used to watch Friday Night Lights. That might be one of my all-time favorites. Connie Britton, that's right. Oh, I thought you were asking what her name was on the show. No, no, I mean, as an actress. <laughs> She's Raina James. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She's fantastic. And by the way, I, a couple months ago, I did a show at O'Gara's with uh, a local band called The Last Ride. They're kind of a country pop group, and uh, they played they played around here a lot, and a couple of them are going out to Nashville just to basically go all in on songwriting and music culture because Nashville is the home of that stuff. What about you? What's your favorite? Uh, favorite TV show? Yeah. Uh, I need to find some new... Well, tell you what. Of all I got time. home... Of all time. Oh, of all time. Oh, good Lord. Because now Netflix has a lot of them and stuff. Right? Of all time, I'd have to say... And it's a cl- complete cliched answer, but I don't care because cliches often are true, is The Wire. Uh, you know, especially for somebody in my business, it was written by a newspaper journalist who lived in Baltimore, who worked the streets, who worked the cop beat. Everything he wrote was just like a documentary. I've never seen it. Oh, it's, it's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant, and it's completely gut-wrenching. It's just basically everything that's wrong with American society in one series. Uh, greatest characters, greatest writing. Uh, it, it's phenomenal. It really is. Uh, recently, uh, Justified just ended. That was, oh, that, was, that was a good show. That's a great show with a great ending. It's so hard to end a TV show, series right. They nailed really? it. The other recent one that's grabbed me has been Better Call Saul. Okay, that's the break off of Breaking Bad. Saul Goodman is a character from Breaking Bad. Yeah. And they go back like eight years before he met the meth dealers and just see how he became, see how he became kind of a, uh, a, fun, a key figure in the later series. And, I, you know, spinoffs often aren't very good. I had low expectations. It's phenomenal. It, what it's great. Is that, uh, that is AMC. Highly recommend it. Of course, have you watched Breaking Bad? I have, but I don't have cable. Okay, we well, do uh, the the red uh, the red box Hulu. Or, okay, and yeah. the Netflix. Yeah, and, so. and eventually it'll be available. ESPN, to you. watch ESPN. Yeah, eventually it'll be available to you, and that, it, it's it's phenomenal. How about movie? Give me a movie. <sighs> There's a lot, but I one that I, I just love every every time I watch it is Zoolander. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think it's hilarious. Do you remember a baseball player called Lou Ford? Yeah, uh, Lou Ford. God, how do I say this? Uh, Lou Ford's teammates weren't sure whether he was a little goofy or whether he was really goofy. And they just kind of rode him. They needled him constantly. And the one thing he could do to get them to laugh and shut up, he could do the Zoolander face better than anybody I've ever seen. He would turn and do the, the, the Zoolander face, the Zoolander pose, and they would just fall down. He was awesome. <laughs> change, change everything, right? Yes. No one's thinking about you anymore. Uh, how about, well, we talked a little about music. Give me a favorite band or song or something. I'll just tell you what's on my playlist right now. Good. A little bit of the new Drake, um, Kali Buds, and Revelation. Revelation. Ah. Revolution, sorry. I have not gotten into Drake. That's probably a generational thing. Yeah. But uh, I, I just don't know much about him. You know, I probably like him. I like a little rap, and I like, I like reggae, like chill music. Oh, it just makes me happy, and I like to be happy. I love reggae. I, that yeah. Reggae is something I should listen more to. You should do Revolution. They're good. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, it, I mean, I, I'm a big Mob, Bob Marley guy, oh, obviously. Yeah. I of love Bob Marley, and I, and I always regret that I don't listen to him more. Uh, here's the tough one. You know, I've gotten some amazing answers from people in the local sports scene when I ask this. Answer the question, or fi- finish, the, finish the sentence, I was wrong about. <laughs> I was... Oh, since we, I was talking about this earlier today, mm-hmm. but we never got to bring up. I was wrong about, <laughs> I was wrong to put a picture of Eric Jerky on social media that I shouldn't have. Uh, was he clothed? <laughs> he was clothed. So Eric's, Eric's dad, and uh, Eric works for Minnesota United, he does a lot for us. He's awesome, but um, so is Andrea. <laughs> His dad and my dad were... Uh, our sisters played soccer together, so they were like fishing wow. buddies, drinking buddies, stuff like that. So, like the first time I met him, he's like, "Oh, I think I was, uh, I was drinking Captain Morgan's with you on on a cruise." I was like, "Oh, I don't drink Captain. Like that's my other brother. Like I didn't go on a cruise with you." <laughs> but uh, so this year, I think it might be started in Arizona. I, just you're bored and you're in the hotel, so I uh, started texting my dad. I was like, "Hey, talk to talk to Paul Durkee and get pictures of, of Eric." When he was little, 
so occasionally I've been getting some pictures and of him in his childhood and I've been tweeting about him and stuff and uh the most recent one I got he was in in a tutu <laughs> I posted and he's like dude with all this MLS thing can you please erase that I was like all right good call I'll, I'll do that and this was last week he was wearing the tutu yeah <laughs> that's the problem it wasn't a childhood picture anymore and he not was, that there's he, anything wrong with that you know we're, <laughs> no. we're very open-minded people you here. do, on your you own do whatever you want and soccer is too right absolutely uh, so my guest is Brian Coleman, Minnesota United. First game this weekend. Please check out their website. Uh, they are still selling tickets. Uh, not sold out yet, right, Andre? Nope. Yeah. So they're still selling tickets. Uh, fill up the joint. Uh, you can listen to this and all podcasts at suhanunfiltered.com, via iTunes, via iHeartRadio. Next couple of podcasts coming up, 5 o'clock on Wednesday, 4 o'clock on Wednesday at the Liffey across from the XL Energy Center with Michael Russo. Again, we'll, that is one of the Kara Irish pubs, so we'll be giving away 50 Guinnesses to the first 50 who show, people who show up and retweet or, uh, or like or somehow respond on, on social media to that request. Then on Friday from St. Louis, Russo and I will be doing, doing another live broadcast uh, from the press box before Game 5 in St. Louis. And then uh, next week we'll have a new slate of guests and shows coming up. Uh, Brian, I appreciate it. I want to give you one last shot here. Tell, tell me something about yourself or your career that, uh, that I haven't asked you that you want to talk about. Give me kind of one last good shot. Uh, <laughs> Twitter handle, Brian Coleman 14 Good. <laughs> okay, now, and since you didn't really give me a great answer to that, I'm going to push you. Tell me, tell me something about yourself that I, you really don't want to tell me. That I really don't. Turkey's help guided into giving me dirt. I don't want. What else? So no. dirt in the oh, you guys don't get to see this on the radio, but check out that nose. Ooh, why? You know what? I've been sitting as next to you, and I didn't really get the full, full, full on look. You don't even notice until it, you see it. it it's took like a so broken, it's attractive. Good lord! Yeah. How, and how, tell me the story behind that. W- which story? <laughs> <laughs> It's like uh, a Brett, one of Brett Favre's fingers. It, it, it <laughs> goes eight different directions. It's, so just it's, repeated blows to the nose? I've, I've had it happen. I've for sure broken it once playing soccer, one not playing soccer, and possible a, a, another close call playing soccer. So. Wow. That's, that's impressive. It's, I've actually had to go in and, and get it checked out by a specialist, and they were like, well, are you, gonna, are you done playing soccer? I said, no. They're like, <laughs> then you're not Don't getting that fixed. Yeah. So. Wow. That's, I can that's still breathe a, fine. There, uh, there are hockey players who would wince looking oh yeah. at that. Oh, yeah. And, and they don't have their, any of their own teeth. That, that's really impressive. You, you're obviously dedicated to the sport <laughs> if you're still playing with a nose like that. As you say, what, what do you, how do you describe it? Uh, so ugly it's attractive? Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't say anything about being ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe so broken So broken. Uh, excuse maybe me. That, yeah, I, yeah. that was a bad miscord yeah. on my part. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and Andrea, what's the best way to, uh, to find tickets? 7634 Soccer. 7634 Soccer. 7634 Soccer. Call for uh, tickets to this weekend's game and, and all future games. And I'm sure we'll be having more uh, Minnesota United guests on as we go forward. Thanks for listening. And again, uh, we'll be giving away a lot of Guinness going forward. And we will try, we'll be talking a certain amount of soccer as we go forward. Thanks for bringing Brian out. Brian, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And we'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it.